So yeah, flow maps are a lot of fun and uh, hard to draw, notoriously. They're really hard to draw, at least in an automated method, they're hard to draw. So I remember I got first interested in them about 10 years ago when I worked as the in-house cartographer for a think tank in Toronto, because Canada. And uh, we were mapping the flow of air traffic passengers uh, throughout the world and their potential acting as vectors for diseases. So uh, at the time, I couldn't find anything that uh, was available to help me draw these things in a relatively expedient manner because the plan was to draw many of them. Uh, so we ended up resorting to doing things like this where we would define a single origin or a single destination and map out how much uh, traffic a place would receive or send or what have you, or continuous surfaces like this that were basically interpolations of, of densities that are uh, imperfect ways of, of showing things. But of course, flow maps in general, right, we're talking about stuff that has arrows for the most part. There's lots of different kinds of flow maps, and I think that part of the difficulty in um, getting an automated way to draw them is simply formulating exactly how what this map is and how the arrows should work. Uh, so there are multiple different kinds. So today we're looking at just maps that have arrows, single arrows that go from one place to another and reflect some sort of magnitude, right? So an amount of people or an amount of something or the uh, directions in which cannabis traveled around the world. <laughs> this right here. So everybody's aware of Menard's famous thing. This seems to be the holy grail. and. Uh, and other, su other such maps like this. But super quick review of other things. Tobler was working on this for several decades uh, with some interesting results um, back in the day and interesting efforts to get it going. About 10 years ago when I first got interested, uh, I came across this paper here, uh, which is a computer science, computer vision paper, and they put together some software free and open source that people could use to generate uh, flow maps like you see on the far right. All right, so there's a lot of uh, what's called edge bundling going on here. So one of the big problems with flow maps, of course, is they get chaotic and messy with arrows all over the place. So one of the ways that uh, computer scientists, at least, have often tried to tackle the problem is to take a bunch of these lines and tie them together at certain places and then let them branch off elsewhere. So that's what you see going on, going on there. And that works as long as you have a sort of hierarchical flow, right, that you can attach things to and from certain places. There's been a series of papers in the last uh, two or three years, a series of very good work by Bernhard Yenny and Brooke Marston and a bunch of other folks who uh, did an empiric study of what people preferred to see cognitively and aesthetically in their flow maps in terms of how arcs should lie relative to each other, how they should curve. Uh, and they've got an interesting method developed that is force-directed, so their flows actually iteratively separate themselves out uh, by, by repelling each other on a map. So, so that's a really interesting method that's very uh, applicable to interactive map displays especially, and they've got a website demonstrating it. Uh, so check it out, because it's good work. Um, but yeah, some more of that same sort of thing has been, done, has been modeled in QGIS by Anita Gracer, and we've also seen a lot of people do relatively straightforward applications such as uh, geodesics, right? So this is taking advantage of the fact that a straight line on the Earth's surface, right, once you apply it to a map projection, is almost always going to be curved, right? So uh, one of the ways you can produce curved lines automatically is to simply calculate the great arc, uh, the arc of the great circle between two places on Earth, then, re then project the map and you get something along the lines of this. So I decided to tackle the problem again because a friend of mine a couple years ago said, hey, Paolo, do you know any good way to draw flow maps? And I was like, no. And, uh, and I thought, okay, then I want to try making one. 
and I like to write a lot of software and algorithms and whatnot, so I went to work on making a Python script that uh, is just a few hundred lines of Python that basically takes out a, uh, a set of origin and destination points and draws what I think is a pretty decent flow of arrows. It's under development and there's still work to be done, but this, for example, is the best sort of thing I've been able to come up with so far, applying both the uh, computation that my script does and some nice map symbology available in QGIS, for example. So uh, I work a lot with both Q and Arc, but I tend to be a pretty, pretty heavy open source open source type person. And the script I, I wrote is open source and it's online and you can all use it and criticize me when it makes gnarly maps for you. So um, yeah, so I was inspired by a, a, a couple talks ago and decided I needed to show off some of my sketches too. Because <laughs> um, it's, it's a super, super important part of at least how I do, how I try to approach my work is I do a lot of uh, a lot of sketching it out by hand and thinking graphically this way in a, in a rough, messy way. So I started, as we saw a couple screens back, I started with the idea of playing with geodesics, right? Of playing with arcs of great circles on the Earth and doing some form of geometric transformation to them uh, so that they would curve in the projected map. But I also wanted to try to remove the artifacts of that curvature because the uh, geodesics don't produce a clean, nice, symmetric, or radially symmetric curve, at least most of the time anyways, right? So I started with a script that created a custom azimuthal map projection for every origin point, <laughs> and uh, that's not that hard to do once, once you know how to manipulate proj4 strings and Python packages that can remap the geometry. Um, and that was working pretty well, but I wasn't crazy about the output. But that's the kind of stuff you saw up, uh, up there in sort of the middle, and trying to figure out how do I radially separate the flows that are coming off of any one point so that things don't clutter too much. Uh, and there's a series of these geometric computational geometry problems that I'm still grappling with. A lot of this is, is kind of work in progress. But, decided that the, uh, the custom azimuthal map projection thing wasn't, wasn't really working out, and it led me to think, well, I want to be able to make flow maps in any map projection, right? So if I make a geodesic, there's only one true geodesic between any two places on Earth. Uh, well, there's two if you go the long way around the Earth. <laughs> but, uh, but I wanted to make something that um, would make a, a radially symmetric curve. That's one of the things that uh, Jenny et al. Uh, concluded empirically is, is a desirable feature in flow maps. I wanted to make radially symmetric curves in any projection. So I abandoned the azimuthal, azimuthal type thing and instead have been uh, working ever since on a projection invariant cubic spline. All right, so that's just a mathematical function that approximates the way a piece of wood would bend between three points, basically. That's what an old-fashioned spine was. Actually, I'm not sure what, whether they were made of wood or not, but anyways. Um, and, uh, and so that's what I've been working on ever since and trying to tweak that. So, so this is what we got. And this is what, what my script does, is it takes the points you give it, it plots them in whatever map projection you've asked for, right? So origin, destination, calculates the straight line arc in the projection space of that, midpoint of that and up some fraction which right now is uh, by default is 0.15 of the distance of the straight line arc uh, and establishes a third point which I'm calling the deviation point, right? And so these are the three points that then we can build a cubic spline along, right? So the, uh, the green or the orange and the distance, the orange line, sorry, and the point at which you bisect the green line are things that the user can tweak. So for example, if you wanted to, instead of have a symmetric, perfect symmetric curve, if you wanted it to curve more here and be straighter here, you could move this over a bit, 
right, and then establish the point over there, or you could establish the point further out, right, to make a swoopier, that's a technical term, a swoopier <laughs> curve, <laughs> right? So basically the, the only thing that's mandatory, at least for a cubic spline, is that the, um, is that it's a true function in that if you, if you remember your, your pre-calculus and whatnot, the, the line can't curve back on itself. But as long as we define things this way, then, uh, then it'll work. So in order to actually find the mathematical function and program this in so that it all happens automatically, we just do a few, a few uh, affine transformations. So that arc that we saw a moment ago has been shifted over to the origin point of the coordinate system at zero, zero, right? And we've rotated it however necessary so that the start and end points are both on the x-axis, right? And then wherever that deviation point falls, however far along and high up, it's guaranteed to be between origin and destination in x values. And once we have that, there's a fabulous Pyth Python library, SciPy, that allows you to calculate, uh, calculate a cubic spline. So I use that. And once you have the cubic spline, then all you need to do is decide how many vertices you want on that polyline, right? So what we're doing, what my script does, that's another user settable parameter. Hello, cursor, there we go. So I basically say, okay, give me 200 evenly spaced X points between these, whoops, between these two points right, and just interpolate what the corresponding y value would be along the blue line, right, which then gives me 202 points um, along the line, and all I have to do really is rotate and translate those points back to their actual place in the map projection space, and I get an arc. So, open source script, like I say, it's all Python that I wrote, uh, except of course I'm leveraging some fabulous libraries out there that are available to everyone and are free, including the Geospatial Data Abstraction Library, uh, which is super powerful. If you haven't used it, use it. Um, as well as SciPy and Shapely. And I designed the thing, I wanted it to be as interoperable as possible, as in wanted anybody to be able to use it. So I designed the thing to take a CSV, a simple CSV as input. So what you do is you give it a table that looks like this, right? And it's generally easy to produce uh, a table like this. Obviously, you might have to manipulate your data a little bit. But you need to give it a origin name and a destination name, and each one of those needs its latitude and longitude coordinates in WGS84, in the World Geodetic System 84, and then you can give it a flow magnitude. And once you've done this, you can then specify any kind of output projection, and the script does all the conversion for you for the geometry, right? So an example of how this works is like this. So far, it's a command line tool. I will probably build a simple GUI to make it a little more friendly to people who are scared of the command line and, uh, and make it a little bit more point and click, whatnot. But you, uh, you call the script, you give it its input, it writes a shape file to output, and optionally you can give it a uh, proj4 string, which is a standard format in the proj4 library of specifying a map projection. Uh, you can also give it the URL to the proj4 string on spatialreference.org, and it'll suck it in and go from there, right? So again, this is the sort of thing it can do, right? I've got a, a azimuthal map projection, in this case, centered on the South Pole, and I've got a bunch of flows coming out of um, New Zealand, in this case. You can go crazy and do fun things like the bond projection, and, uh, and the, the flows all draw in the basically the geometry of the projected system. So that's all fun and well and good, and then I got interested in doing it in 3D, okay? So again, the concept here was, again, to use cubic splines and to basically bring this up into the Z dimension, right? Not just X and Y. Uh, and I've got a second script that I'm working on that takes linear features and uh, using what I'm calling a unit spline, 
uh, applies a scaling upward spline to them and arcs them up in 3D space. And these write out to file formats that can support 3D. So KML, uh, DXF, that's an AutoCAD format, if, you ever, if you've ever worked with that, or Esri's multi-patch, multi-patch features. Then they have to be, to be uh, visualized, at least in a sort of 3D volumetric way, you have to take these lines, which mathematically a line has zero surface area, right? So you have to take these lines and fatten them up, uh, turn them into tubes of some sort, uh, which is a matter of creating a bunch of triangular, uh, triangular meshes or manifolds, depending upon which, which discipline you're from, they call them different things, uh, and polygonizing them basically, or solidifying them. So extrusion into 3D, right? And the neat thing about that is this allows for some kind of, uh, having a 3D model like this is really interesting if you're going to have some interactivity in exploring it, so panning, zooming, orbiting, what have you, right? So, for example, right, so a little chaotic and crazy right now, but these are my flows, for example, coming off that script visualized on Google Earth, right? And uh, I kind of like this thing because it allows you to, you know, orbit and zoom and pan and uh, I don't have any real super nice interactivity built into it yet, but theoretically you should be able to click on things and highlight them and then get a little pop-up that tells you what not. And also you can symbolize these to be fatter or thinner, right? Uh, so far I've just been tackling the problem of getting the, the geometry down in X, Y, and Z. So you can do this sort of thing. Similarly, whoops, there it is in arc scene. Right? Same sort of thing. So you see the two-dimensional flows are underneath, right? Simple green lines. And then a, uh, a nice 3D buffer in, in arc was able to produce these tubes here, right? So yeah, again, neat for interactivity. Looks kind of spider-like, right? And, uh, and those curves can be tweaked again by, by applying some of that, you know, where do you want to bisect the straight line vector and how much swoopiness do you want? And those are the kinds of parameters that I plan to start uh, iteratively experimenting with in order to deal with, uh, you know, crossing issues when lines cross each other, when lines are really close to each other. So this is just a dummy data set, but I tried, for example, to on purpose put a couple things that were really close to each other so that you'd end up having, having flows that uh, are, aren't as easy to differentiate, at least if you're looking at them here. Everything here is originating out of the Azores, which is a wonderful place that you must visit. Right? So the next logical step for this was to move into augmented reality, which is something that I've become really interested in doing. Um, so, this is a really neat machine. It's a Microsoft HoloLens, uh, and I got to buy it with research money, yay. <laughs> and uh, it's, um, it's interesting. So this is augmented reality, which is distinct from virtual reality. In virtual reality, your face or your vision is completely taken over by what you're being shown, right? In augmented reality, the idea is you still see the real world, you just see stuff on top of it, right? So what this does is it has some fancy lenses in there that have optics that take stuff projected from the computer in here and bounce it into your eyes and, uh, and allow you to see things placed on top of the real world. It's quite convincing. And um, one of the reasons for that is that this thing is location aware, it's got a GPS, and it also knows where all the walls and surfaces in this room are, right? So for example, there's obvious applications for things like video games where you have, uh, say, a character that you're interacting with and that character stands on the same floor that you're on, right? 
because this thing knows where the floor is. There's basically a bunch of LiDAR sensors built into this, right? And it's constantly mapping the, uh, the location of where you are. So what a cool thing for data exploration, right? So if this will work, this is a little video that I straight captured from the HoloLens in my hotel room last night, exploring a rudimentary uh, flow map in 3D. future is now. <laughs> I realize this might be a little bit dizzying to watch this. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you.